This episode is brought to you by Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Rated TVMALV. Viewer discretion advised. Maya Lopez has betrayed her mentor, the notorious Kingpin. Now on the run, she returns to her hometown to prepare for the biggest fight of her life. Don't miss Marvel Studios' hardest-hitting series yet. An epic five-episode event. Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. On the Omaha Indian Reservation, eight miles north of Decatur, Nebraska, is a hill overlooking the Missouri River. Blackbird was a great Omaha Indian chief, and he was buried there, seated upright on his favorite horse. A mound of dirt near 45 feet high marks his burial place. When Lewis and Clark visited his grave in 1804, they left behind decorations to commemorate him. It is said that Blackbird Hill is haunted, and dozens of people gather there on October 17th. So, it's coming up if you're nearby. But it's not the ghost of Chief Blackbird that still haunts this hill, but rather that of a young woman murdered there over a century ago. In early 1840, a young couple back east fell in love. After the boy finished school, he planned to travel abroad to marry the girl. The boy never returned from his trip abroad. Typical. After waiting for several years, the girl finally gave up the boy for dead and married another man. Soon, they headed west, eventually settling in Nebraska, atop Blackbird Hill. The young girl was astounded to see her old fiancé walking up the winding path from the Missouri River to her small cabin on October 17, 1849. She was elated to see him and confessed her undying love. She had only wed another believing that he had perished in a shipwreck. He began explaining that for the last five years of his life, a long voyage abroad ended with a harrowing shipwreck where he barely made it out alive. Returning home, he was saddened to find that his beloved mother had died and his betrothed had wed someone else, making a new life out west. Intent on finding her, he joined up with a wagon train bound for California seeking out his lost love along the way. As soon as he reached the West Coast, he found her nowhere. And heartbroken, he traveled along the Missouri River to return home. When he landed at Blackbird Hill one day, fate intervened and brought the long-lost pair back together when he followed the winding path up her slope. The girl told him that when her husband returned home, She would tell him that she wished to be released from her marriage vows so that they could leave together the next morning. Giving the couple time to discuss the situation, the young man hid in the nearby woods. When the woman's husband returned home, she explained the situation. But, as you can imagine, he didn't want her to leave, and at first, he begged her to stay. When she refused, he began to get angry, and soon attacked her with his hunting knife. Screaming, she fell onto the floor. The husband then dropped the knife and gathered up his bleeding wife. With her in his arms, he ran to the cliff at the top of the hill and jumped with her into the river far below. After giving chase, the young man reached the summit just in time to hear the woman's last scream of agony and see the man leap from the summit. After collapsing with grief, the young man wandered aimlessly through the hills until Omaha Indians found him half-starved and ragged. The natives carried the man back to their village as he was delirious and unable to speak, where he was taken care of until he was able to travel again. In today's world, the path from the cabin to the cliff edge is barren. In spite of more than 150 years since the couple's death, no plants will grow on that path. It is said that the woman's chilling screams can be heard up the hill each year on October 17th. Over the years, dozens of people have reportedly heard the cries of terror. Blackbird Hill is eight miles north of Decatur along the Missouri River. The Omaha Indian Reservation is located in northeastern Nebraska, just west of Highway 75. And although the hill lies within the Omaha Reservation, it's not open to the public, so don't get any bright ideas. The scenic overlook, though, offers a great river view. I've been doing this show for a while, and it turns out that Nebraska 
has some of my favorite stories that I've ever come across. So, that took me by surprise. Do you believe in ghosts? Join me on a journey through America's dark and haunted past as we explore the ghost stories and folklore that have been passed down for generations. What scares you? Let's find out. I'm Christopher Feinstein, and this is Haunted American History. School was in session for Jeffrey McCain. In addition to reading, Jeffrey loved school. Books allowed him to explore places outside of Sarpy County, Nebraska. Places that he would have never dreamed of. Jeffy, as he was affectionately called, his favorite book was actually an atlas. It was called Lightman's Guide to World Geography, and it featured maps and pictures of the entire world. He thoroughly enjoyed looking at pictures of Africa. Occasionally, When he walked to school, he would pretend that he was actually walking across the African savannah's arid, grassy plains. There would always be wildebeests over the next hill, or lions hunting in the tall grass. When he showed his papa a drawing of one, his father said, Oh, that's the weirdest cow I'd ever seen. When Jeffy was almost ten, he was out in the field with his older brother Thomas. His papa felt free to let loose a few cuss words. He wasn't in Africa today. The sky was overcast, gray, and pregnant with rain. As he crossed the bridge over the creek near the school, he wondered if it would flood. Last spring, heavy rains caused the creek to overflow, filling Papa's fields and covering the land around it. But those were problems for another day. When he looked up, he saw Miss Holly. That meant he was almost at the schoolhouse. Jeffy McCain's teacher, Holly, was one of the prettiest girls he had ever seen. Next to his mama, of course. She was tall and solidly built. Her muscles still hard after nearly two decades on her parents' farm. Holly's parents had only been blessed with herself and her sister, Pauline. Pauline was short and slender like her mom, while Holly was tall and broad like her father. Holly's father brought her out to work in the field because he had no sons to help him and he couldn't afford to hire a farmhand. A few years away at the teacher's college had little affected her strength. Jeffy didn't care. He loved school, but he knew he'd probably end up with his own farm someday. Listen, he loved agriculture too, and dreamed of the day where he would have his own patch of land with a pretty wife by his side. It would be even better if the lucky woman who he chose to share his last name with had the same delicate features and auburn hair like Miss Holly. By the school bell, she watched Addie Thompson and her sister Helen. Jacob Myers was talking with George Simpson about the spring planting, and Ida Goetz was playing a game with Emma Hasmuller. As Jeffy was making his way to join the other school kids, Miss Holly rang the bell. Everyone stopped what they were doing and hurried inside. Jeffy smiled as he passed Miss Holly. Greetings, Miss Holly, he said cheerfully. As if she hadn't heard him, she just kept ringing the bell. Jeffy thought to himself that his papa would have said, that damn bell is too loud, but he wouldn't say that in front of Miss Holly. Keeping his desk clean and orderly was one of his favorite things to do, just like Miss Holly liked. He knew part of that was probably because she had to clean all the desks at the end of the school day, but he was glad to help out. Miss Holly's feet clicked across the hardwood floor toward her desk at the front of the room as the big door shut behind her. Seeing them, Miss Holly sat down and stared. The children looked back, waiting for her to give them instructions and begin the day. But Miss Holly just sat there, watching them. Jeffy felt uncomfortable, and he was sure he wasn't the only one. They were supposed to wait for her instructions and Jeffy was definitely not a rule breaker. Her breath came quickly and hard as if she was carrying something heavy. Jeffy noticed that her eyes, they looked bloodshot, just like Papa's did the year before when he was helping Mr. Harrison deliver a calf. Miss Holly jumped up screaming without warning. Jeffy and the other children gasped, their breath caught in their throats. A sound unlike any Jeffy had ever heard. It was sad and pleading and full of rage all at once. 
It was primal. It was defiant. Like how warriors of ancient times would have sounded. And with a bang, Miss Holly's chair slammed to the floor behind her. Her eyes were wide and wild. In a flash, Addie and Helen jumped out of their seats. Emma and Ida were not far behind, running for the door. She roared, Monsters! You're all monsters! Despite Addie's efforts, the door wouldn't open. Ida grabbed the knob too, and she and the girls pulled with all their might, but it still wouldn't move. Jacob and George jumped up out of their seat, ran to the door and began pounding on it, begging for help. A stunned Jeffy knew that he should run, but he couldn't. He felt as if though he was in a dream, held in place by invisible rope. Seeing Miss Holly bend over and grab something from behind the desk, Jeffy felt his stomach twist. She was holding the axe they used for firewood. Her lips were stretched in a horrible grin as she walked around her desk. She calmly said, All of you are monsters, and monsters have no place here. I'm going to get rid of all the monsters, children. With an awful, insane glee, she stepped up to Jeffy's desk. It'll feel like a splinter for a little bit. I'll clean it up quickly, she said soothingly. Sometimes singing helps things feel better. Would you like to sing with me, Jeffrey? She asked. A deep fear ran screws through Jeffrey's jaw and held them fast. He was vaguely aware that someone was screaming. It seemed like a lot of people were screaming, but he was unable to hear it very well, as if someone had stuffed cotton into his ears. The whole world had gone quiet. As she sang... Jeffrey recognized it as the song they sang in church. He couldn't remember all the words, but he knew the part about being washed in the lamb's blood. As she raised the axe high above her head, she brought it crashing down. It was pure and clean, like the fluffy white clouds of a summer day. And Holly smiled to herself as she listened to the stream splash and gurgle below her. These demons had taken over her beloved children. They had burrowed into their necks and taken root like rotten seeds. However, Holly knew exactly how to save them. Her daddy taught her to be brave and strong, and she knew immediately what to do. It was a difficult task, but it had to be done. Holly was almost done, but there was one more thing to do. She carefully lifted the cloth off the basket and looked inside it. This was too important to make any mistakes. She counted under her breath. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. She smiled again. She got them all. The time had come. They were infected like a raw wound left untended. Holly hadn't seen it at first, but when she saw Emma playing in the yard that morning, she knew. It was as if she could see inside her chest, see the darkness inside. She had already known about the monsters in town. Holly had witnessed one and a woman buying flour at the general store in Papillion, and another and a man who tipped his hat to her outside of church. When Holly saw the children that day, she knew what God had asked her to do just as she knew how to draw air into her lungs. She knew what God needed her to do. She knew immediately that she had to obey his will. So she went and got the axe, and she put it behind her desk, and locked the door as soon as the children entered the school. It was dark work, but God's will is God's will, and it has to be done. She reached into the basket and took out each of their hearts, They were black, oozing. A green liquid dripped from them. It looked like ink, and it stained her hands. Although she didn't want to cut out the children's hearts, she knew that outside of their little bodies, she could clean them. Although Holly wasn't sure how to do that, she was sure God would lead her in the right direction. He had led her this far, and she was confident that he would give her the right guidance. Send her 
on a course into the right direction. Seeing the heart in her hand, she knew. Giving thanks to the Almighty, she let it fall out into the water. Holly prayed that the pure waters would wash it clean. Then one by one, she gently dropped the others in. Splash into the creek. They belonged to her children. They deserved the best treatment. Also, she trusted God to bring them back to her. As she walked from the creek back to the school, that knowledge brought her comfort, and she began to sing again. Upon returning inside, Holly noticed the thick black and green monster blood covering the floor. And this would take a while to clean up, she thought. After walking up to the front of the room, she sat behind her desk and smiled at her children. Now that that nasty business was out of the way, it was time to start today's lessons. Holly said, Good afternoon, children. The children didn't answer, much to her surprise. As Holly greeted them again, she shouted a little louder this time. Good afternoon, children. But no one responded. Why didn't any of you answer me? What was wrong? Oh, it's because they're dead, she thought. But that couldn't be right. She hadn't killed the children. She only killed the monsters. She saved the children. She had seen their tainted hearts run through bright green veins. They weren't monsters. You murdered them. Holly pressed both of her hands to the side of her head. She released a low groan, realizing what she'd done. She squeezed her eyes shut, fighting the feeling inside her that her vision was spinning. Upon looking again, the realization dawned on her. She'd killed them all. The heads of Jeffy and the other children stared back at her, in mute accusations from the desktops on which she'd placed them. She had thought her grandmother's madness had passed out of the family. She had memories of her grandmother talking to her in hushed secret whispers about the red-eyed man who spoke to her from underneath the bed at night. She said that her deceased brother Charles lived in the closet now and that the whole house was being watched. Her grandfather and her daddy took her to the county hospital after finding her trying to burn the house down. She was convinced that that was the only way to protect her family from the people her brother from the closet had warned her about. The voice in her head wasn't God's voice, but the whispering, raving madness of Holly's own insanity. She knew now that she had the same terrible disease her grandmother did, and that she had done horrible things. Miss Holly dropped to her knees in front of the schoolhouse as a gentle rain began to fall. She threw her head back and howled. Her mournful wail drifted over the green Nebraska grass. This story of Miss Holly and her delusional rampage is entirely fictional. There's no account of how it really happened or if it really happened at all. Some say Miss Holly really existed. Some say she didn't. Others call her Holly Hatchet and refer to the school as the Hatchet House. The Hatchet House was built near Portland, Nebraska in 1890, one of the several hundred one-room schoolhouses that dotted the Nebraska landscape during that period and into the early 20th century. Teachers often came from various backgrounds and taught there for a year or so. They often lived with local families while they taught. As Portal declined and folded in the early 20th century, it became one of Nebraska's many ghost towns. But the school survived, and it was moved because of flooding in the surrounding area. As part of its relocation to Papillion, Nebraska, the building was purchased by the Papillion Area Historical Society in 1995. I love saying Papillion. They used it for meetings, tours, and to educate groups of schoolchildren about the actual history of the building, the county, and the state. The Portal School serves as a well-maintained and valuable part of Nebraska history. And the legend is part of that history. We don't care so much about where and when the legend began today as we do about why it began. Why did someone make up such a bloodthirsty and vicious tale about such an innocent place? 
When we go to parties and sit at bars, we tell stories about ourselves and others to keep the boredom of everyday life at bay. We use movies, books, and even music to tell us stories to help us escape. There are times when they're meant to entertain or educate. Other times, they're meant to serve as a cautionary tale. One night, a group of friends are sitting around talking. They're bored. They've told each other all the juicy gossip they know, and they're running out of conversation ideas when, suddenly, one of them has one. They ask the others, Did you know there was a murder at that school down the road? Someone replies, That never happened. I would have heard about it. The story was told to me by a friend of my grandfather. You know, my grandpa, he was a good Christian man, and he would never hang out with liars. The teacher was thrown into an asylum after the kids' families moved away, and the whole thing was kept very quiet, so no one would be scared. They all know teachers frequently moved to the area year after year, and many have migrated west to search for better opportunities, so it adds up. Moreover, they are likely to have heard about the axe murders in the Midwest. An axe was a convenient weapon to use on a farm. Newspapers, especially in areas where there wasn't much going on, used Associated Press stories to fill their pages with sensational crimes that people would buy their papers to read. People in eastern Nebraska heard stories of murders committed on farms just like theirs, from Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, and several other places. Villisca is just a short drive from Papillion, and you can be damn sure the papers wrote about that one. I did a whole segment about how newspapers ran with stories like that in my Iowa episode. There were stories that were stuck in the mind, and people would talk about them in whispers in their sewing circles, at barbershops, or just with friends. When a buddy tells you that a similar murder occurred, and this one right down the road, it doesn't seem that far-fetched. When the friend tells them about the deception or not, the legend has already been born. One of them retells the story, but they can't quite remember all the details. Perhaps they add a few things, like Holly being the teacher's name. People love gruesome details, so maybe they mention all the blood. As the story progresses, a teacher becomes insane, they behead the children, they cut out their hearts. The killer then throws the hearts into the creek nearby and leaves. It all depends on who tells it. Maybe at the end they committed suicide, or maybe they just left. As a result, a ghost story is born. After all the classes have finished at the haunted schoolhouse, young boys dare each other to enter it after dark. In order to get their significant others to snuggle with them a little closer, young men tell their would-be girlfriends the story to scare them. The old snuggle trick. The story eventually becomes a local legend. It doesn't have to be rooted in fact, since that's not what matters. It becomes a tradition to tell the next generation so they can adapt it to their own lives. The telling and the hearing of a story become a part of local history. When children are old enough, they are told the story of the portal school, and in turn, they tell their children. They tell their nieces, they tell their nephews, they tell their cousins. Each successive generation imparts their own signature on the legend as they pass it on. It becomes a kind of rite of passage that intertwines itself with the culture of the region. In some circles, it's still known as the portal school. In others... It's known as the Hatchet House. Over the years, the details of the story have changed. The story has morphed into all kinds of different versions, taking different twists and turns. But the story still exists. Thanks to oral storytelling and the internet. Hey folks. Uh, just wanted to stop in right here just to say thank you to everybody for the reviews like I always do. They're fantastic. Um, the voicemails I've been getting, uh, I've been getting a voicemail, uh, I got actually two from this gentleman, and, uh, I just, you know, he was like, hey, you know, just tell me how much he loves the stories, and how that he's an aspiring writer, and how, um, my stories inspire him, and I just, uh, don't know what to say to that. Having someone say that to me about my stories, and about how it's inspiring their writing is just something that I can't quantify with thought so I just want to say I didn't have I don't know how a way to reach back to you because you never left like a contact information or an email if you want to you know you've sent me two voicemails already send me an email and if you're having trouble 
you know, you said you were having a little bit of trouble with inspiration and, you know, content and the kind of things like that. Listen, send me an email. I'll help you out. Um, as best as I can. Not that I'm some sort of expert, but, you know, I'll do what I can. I'll, 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 I'll give you a peek into my process and maybe that will unlock something in your process. And this way, listen, we get another creative out there. We get another writer. So send me an email, please. You know who you are. Um, speaking of writing and stories, I cannot wait for you guys to hear my new show, The Nightmare Collective, which will be launching the last week of October, right around Halloween. The Thursday, Friday, and the Monday, Tuesday before Halloween will be the first four stories. But before those stories launch on that channel, I will debut at least two of them here on this channel. Just to give you a little taste of what to expect on the Nightmare Collective. Even though, I mean, if you guys have been listening to the show and listening to my stories, you know what to expect from me. And this is the same group of guys that we made seclusion with. So, I mean... It's it's thing it's the guys we I do zoning out with. So if you listen to both shows, you're familiar with us, but now you're gonna you're definitely familiar with me and my sensibilities and my storytelling. Now on that show you're gonna get a couple of other voices, but we all share the same type of sensibilities. So uh I have a trailer that I cut through together real quick. I'm gonna play it now. And I'd love if you guys would join me over there on the Nightmare Collective. The link for the show will be in the show description of this episode and then every episode going forward until the show launches. The Nightmare Collective. I cannot wait for you guys to hear this and uh, enjoy the trailer. Later, folks. Dive into the abyss of the human psyche and beyond with The Nightmare Collective. A podcast that weaves tales of horror, science fiction, and fantasy into a tapestry of dark wonder. Are you ready to venture into uncharted realms where the eerie and the extraordinary collide? Our tales will transport you to a place where reality blurs, nightmares are born, and the impossible becomes all too real. From haunted houses to distant galaxies, from ancient curses to futuristic dystopias, the Nightmare Collective explores the darkest corners of human existence and the boundless possibilities of the unknown. But beware, dear listener, for once you enter, there's no turning back. Welcome to your new nightmare. A pillar of snowy salt once stood on the Nebraska Plain, about 40 miles above the point where the Saline River flows into the Plate River, where men used to hear of it as the Salt Witch. During a long period of time, an Indian tribe was quartered at the confluence of two rivers. Its chief, a man of blood and muscle in whom the people took pride, but so fierce that no one dared introduce themselves except to his wife, who was the only one able to check his tigerish temper. He truly loved her so much that when she died, he became a recluse and refused to see anyone outside of his lodge. During this mood, Mutterings were heard in the tribe, and there was talk of a new chief being chosen. One morning, he emerged dressed in war clothes and strode across the plain to the west without a word to anyone. He returned a month later with something unusual to relate. He also proved his prowess by brandishing a belt of fresh scalps in front of his warriors and bringing a lump of salt. The chief had been journeying across the prairie when a loud wail abruptly woke him. In the pale light of the new moon, he saw a gruesome old woman clutching a tomahawk above a younger woman who knelt in front of her. Desperate for mercy and attempting to free herself from her oppressor's hold on her throat, 
This surprising sight, 40 miles away from the village, caused the chief to hurry toward them. Despite her efforts, it seemed as though escape was impossible for the young woman. Her captor's left hand remained firmly tangled in her hair, while the other lifted the axe, ready to bring it down. In that moment, the chief had a glimpse of his deceased wife's face. Filled with rage, he lunged at the hag and smashed her skull with his hatchet. However, he was too late. The ground opened up and swallowed both women before he could reach her. In their place, all that remained was a pillar of salt. For years after, the indigenous people insisted that a salt witch controlled such an entity. And when they traveled there to collect salt, they would hit the ground with clubs as they thought that every strike was being inflicted upon her to stop her from performing her evil again. With Halloween season approaching, I would be remiss to not give you guys some place to visit. And that place is Seven Sisters Road. According to local legend, seven women were murdered there in 1900. This chilling urban legend that has been around for over 100 years tells of a young man who resided on a farm in the southeast of Nebraska City. He lived with his parents and his seven sisters. After having an altercation with his family members, he was filled with rage. In the dead of night, he lured or forced his sisters out of the house and made them follow him to the top of a hill in the vicinity, which was known for its seven peaks. There he hanged each one of them. After the hangings, no one knew what happened to the bodies or the brother. There was no official reports to support the hangings, but this legend endures. After the rumored murders were committed and the hanging trees were chopped down, Seven Sisters Road was built through the hills. Only four of the hills remain today. Since that fateful evening so long ago, it is said that the restless spirits of the women haunt the area. Over the years, many tales have been told about a fearful woman screaming for help. It has been reported that bells from a nearby private cemetery ring even when nobody is in it. Many people have driven through the area, have reported their cars stalling, their headlights dimming, and their speedometers freezing, and then their windows will roll up and down randomly. It's been reported by some that people have seen shadowy figures in the darkness, watching them with red eyes, or heard voices in muffled whispers, and experienced sudden wind changes and temperature drops. Paranormal groups and individuals alike continue to report strange activities on this creepy road, lined by looping hills, twisted trees, and strange voices. I'm Christopher Feinstein, and this is Haunted American History. I'd like to give a shout to the newest members of the Patreon, Alicia and Charles. Thank you guys so much for joining. Your support literally, quite literally, means everything to me. Can't begin to express how much it means to me that you guys are here. Um, if you guys would like to join the Patreon, patreon.com slash hauntedamericanhistory, we get ad-free episodes and early releases, and just uh, some uh, little chit-chat going on with me. Kind of drop into the Discord and have a nice little time in there and, and you know, have some share some messages with people and just kind of talk about spooky stuff and episodes and stories and you know all kinds of fun things so if you're interested stop on by and uh see you next time later folks